brother. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm really excited to be here, actually. Praise be to Jesus. I was at a holy hour praying about what message the Lord wanted me to share with you today. And the Lord inspired me in a very profound and powerful way. The words kind of came to me from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verse 49. I came to bring fire upon the earth, and would that it were already enkindled. I thought, wow, that's pretty powerful stuff. You know, the Lord basically put it on my heart to say, I have come that you will be manfully alive. And he wants to burn within your chest. And I just thought, Lord, you're going to have to inspire me more because I don't know how to communicate that message to these men. He says, here's what I want you to tell them. You are my son. You were fearfully and wonderfully made and I have created you. Let me remind you of who you are because you have forgotten. Amen? I'm married. This will be my 15th year of marriage by the grace of God. We have six kids from 17 down to a baby on the way. Thank you. Somebody's excited. Praise you, Jesus. Who's got kids here? <laughs> Everybody. When you look at your kids, do you see yourself? Yeah? Yes or yes? I stole that from Matthew Kelly. Don't tell him I said that. Do you like what you see? Do you see things that make you feel uncomfortable? I know I do. When I look at my kids and I see them model back some of the bad behaviors I have, I cringe. I think that's a big part of this message about being man fully alive, brothers. Because beating within your chest is the heart of the Son of the Most High God. And we have to make a choice. Look at the symbol of fire through Scripture. Fire brings the presence of God. I'm thinking of Exodus chapter 24, the, the fire that encapsulates the top of the mountain at Sinai. You know what happened three days before that? Moses went to the people and he said, Purify yourselves. Abstain from sexual relations for three days. And then you can go and be in the presence of God. Guess what happened? They couldn't be in the presence of God. Why do you think? Because they couldn't hold back their disordered passions. And only Moses was allowed to ascend the mountain. So God's fiery presence comes to us. Hebrews chapter 12, God is an all-consuming fire. God also judges sinners. I'm thinking of Matthew 10. Jesus says, Fear not the one who can kill the body, but rather fear the one who can take both body and soul and cast it into the fiery pit of hell. God also purifies sinners and prepares them for heaven through fire. I'm thinking of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. St. Paul says, Every man's works will be burnt and tested through fire. And only the good ones remain. Revelation 21, 27. Only the pure can enter into heaven. Brothers, are we prepared to withstand the heat? Are we living a life that can take the heat? Are we men fully alive or have we accepted a mundane life? I know I did for years. You see, I inherited porn from my father as a boy. So when I grew up, and I told this story two years ago right here, but when I grew up, I wanted to be like my dad. I wanted to make my father proud of me. So I pursued the life that he was pursuing, only I tried to take it to the next level because I thought that would win his approval for me. So I consumed women as if they were commodities. It led to abortion. It led to depression. It led to the near, my near suicide. It led to the near destruction of my marriage, which if that would have happened, none of my children would be alive today. But by the grace of God, 
The Lord, the God of all the universe, interceded in my life and saved me and saved my marriage and saved my children. Praise be to Jesus. Amen. You see, we've got to make a choice. We've got to hear that beat beating in our chest. We've got to drown out the world because the world wants you to believe that you are it. You're all there is. This is your world. The world is your oyster. It revolves around you. Imagine for a minute with me, brothers. Just pretend for one second. A world in which we didn't have to hang plastic cow testicles from the back bumper of our truck in order to prove our manhood to the world. Imagine just for a moment that we lived in a world where every man would use the turn signal built into the car to show respect for other people. Imagine a world in which guys would take the shopping cart and return them to the corral two spaces over instead of leaving them in the middle of the parking lot. Imagine a world in which you'd put the toilet seat down because you had to go pee in the middle of the night and you actually tried to not pee on the floor out of courtesy for your wife who's going to get up after you and deal with it. Because man fully alive does not act like a spoiled brat. Imagine a world where men spent more time with their wives and their children than they did at work. More time with the family than they do with the boys or on the internet or in front of the television or with sports or their hobbies. Because man fully alive lives to serve those whom the Lord has placed into his care and custody. Imagine a world where there was no more abortion, no more contraception, no more devastation through pornography and adultery. Because man fully alive would not tolerate that on his watch. Because man fully alive is a warrior for life from conception until natural death and does not allow the execution of human beings that inconvenience us no matter how small, old, or troubling. Amen? Imagine a world where there were no more broken marriages or broken lives or broken families because man fully alive says yes and he means it and will die rather than break that word. Imagine a world where there was no more hungry, no more homelessness, no more lopsided justice doled out by people who've given their hearts over to the world in the secular ways, but live for Christ because man fully alive would rather crawl to Calvary and there nail himself to die alongside our Lord than to see injustice in the world. Man fully alive, brothers, is a man of faith, virtue, and action. He grows up. Now, how many of you have wounds? Now, I know I do. I've already shared with you my wound for my father, which is deep and still very painful between he and I. I have mother wounds too. We all do. Amen? A man fully alive does not allow his wounds to defeat him because he knows who he is. And he reminds himself of his purpose, his passion, and his mission. He hears the beat burning in his chest. Do you feel the burn, brothers? Or are you so apathetic to the voice of Christ in your life that you can't even hear the beat? Where are your priorities? Man fully alive does not sit around and just wait and watch his family, his friends, his neighbors, his co-worker, that perfect stranger whom the Lord puts into your life, march merrily on to the fiery pit of hell, living and dying in their sins. Because man fully alive realizes 
that God sent him to interact with those people. And man fully alive has zeal for souls, for love of God and his fellow neighbor. Amen? The mundane is the pill that we have swallowed. I know I did for many years. I lived for myself. I was the center of the universe. I worshipped at my altar. Nobody and no thing ever crossed my vision as being anything close to being as important as me. Man fully alive dies to self. You know, we pray this all the time in the Our Father. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do we mean that? Or it just says those words that we recite. You know, as a Protestant growing up, as an anti-Catholic Protestant growing up, that was one of the biggest critiques that we had for the Catholic Church. Oh, your vain repetition, just repeating your prayers. I mean, even though that's scriptural, it didn't matter. To us, that just seemed like you were repeating words like a robot. Do you mean them? Because man fully alive has a mission. And that's to transform the earth into heaven. How do we do that? How does one do that? By doing the will of God. It's that simple. Why? Because He does it. He does all the heavy lifting. You're responsible for effort and attitude. That's it. Success belongs to Him. Amen? You don't have to accomplish the success of the world. You have to show up for the fight. That's it. That's all you got to do. Effort and attitude. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Do you hear that? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. James chapter 2 says, faith without works is dead. Because a man fully alive has faith, virtue, and is engaged. So a man fully alive has to know who he is. I am a son of the Most High God. Guess what? I'm not. I am not my sins. Oh, I sin. Ask my wife, she'll tell you. I sin. But I am not my sins. Amen? Because a man fully alive, if he falls, he gets up. He goes to confession. He receives the grace of Almighty God. The blood poured out on that cross. He hears the sweetest words known to mankind. I remember going to confession after my conversion and confessing adultery and uh, pornography and abortion and all of these things. And I heard the sweetest words. I heard the voice of Christ say to me, I absolve you. Go in peace. When's the last time you've been to confession, brothers? He's waiting for you. He's waiting for you. But the devil's going to whisper into your ears, oh, but you've done this and you've done that. This is who you are. How shameful. Look what you've done. A man fully alive? Here's that. And he ignores the devil. Amen? Amen. A man fully alive remembers the sweet sound of Jesus' voice in the confessional and holds on to it. A man fully alive will never allow another brother to fall on the battlefield of life and do nothing. How many of you have allowed another brother to go away because of divorce? To go away because of pornography? To go away because of the secular draw of the world for lust? power, and material gain. And you've done nothing. I know I'm guilty of that. Am I alone? Man fully alive cannot tolerate that anymore. Because man fully alive has one mission. That's to get them to heaven. Nothing else you do in this life, brothers, is ever going to make a difference. Nothing. Nothing. One mission you have to get them to heaven. I wrote it on a napkin years ago. 
and I keep it in my wallet so that I'll never forget. My only mission in this world is to get them to heaven. Who? Well, my wife and my children, first and foremost, right after myself. You can't give what you don't have, amen? But my mission is also to get you to heaven. Because the Lord has put me in front of you. It's to get my neighbors to heaven, my co-workers, the stranger on the street, every human being on the planet because God loves them. And if he loves them, then so do I because I am a son of the Most High God. Amen? No soul left behind. Is that not your motto? Is that not tattooed in Old English on your back? No soul left behind. If not you, then who? Who's going to save Amarillo? Who? Let me tell you something about Amarillo. Yeah, sure, you don't make as much money as other cities in Texas. That's true. But guess what? Here's a good thing. You are younger than most cities in Texas. But your crime rate is worse than the national average. Your rates are skyrocketing. Right out that door. Women, children, human beings are being abused under your watch. Skyrocketing. Your divorces, much higher than the national average. I mean much higher than the national average. I've lived through my fair share of divorces, trust me. I know what it's like. It ain't easy, it's painful, and it sucks. Man fully alive has to help a brother has to get involved, has to do what he can because the family needs to be shored up. Amen? You have an opportunity, brothers. Amarillo, Texas and beyond is yours. What do you want it to look like? What do you want your young men to grow up to? What kind of man do you want to be? I'm going to tell you a story of a a good friend of mine, his name is Doug Pearson. Doug is a phenomenal guy. Six foot, I don't know, huge. He grew up loving to fight as a hobby. I mean, he's just a brute of a man. Served in the Marine Corps. Essentially a pagan heathen. He's from Las Vegas, but his family moved to Dallas years ago. And when I met Doug, you know, I was intimidated by this guy. He's a pretty intimidating presence. And when I met Doug, he was already a walking saint. I didn't know much about him. But when I got to know him, we went on retreat together. We spent time together. I learned about his past. You know, his God was football. And he would sit at home on Sundays watching football. And he would laugh and make fun and tease his wife and his children as they went off to Mass. Doug raised Protestant, probably anti-Catholic, but his God was football. And then the Lord gave him a moment of clarity one day. Doug, you'll go to your son's football games but you won't go and watch your son serve at the altar. Why not? <clears throat> Doug, you'll support your sons in sports and school and all this other stuff, but Doug, they care about church and the faith. Why won't you support them in that? And Doug said, fine, Lord, I'll go. And he begrudgingly started to go to Mass on Sundays. He wasn't even Catholic. And he started to question, you know, all that Protestant background he had was sort of bothering him. So he started to call Catholic radio and try to ask all the hard questions and start to stump them. And the Lord began to move his heart. And Doug was, again, a brutal guy. So, he, you know, getting in a fight with Doug was easy. But Doug began to transform. He began to change. By the time I met Doug, and he called me one day in 2012 out of the blue, uh, I didn't even recognize the number, I just saw it from Dallas, and I answered, hey, this is Doug Pearson, we're going to be buying a radio station in Houston, we would like to talk to you about running that. And then I got to go meet Doug. And then I got to get to know him very well. 
By that time, Doug didn't even have a television in his home. Doug has nine children, grown kids with grandkids and young ones still at home. Doug spent his time reading to his children. Do you read to your children, brothers? You granddads, do you read to your, your grandkids? Do you spend time with your kids? Do you know them? Man fully alive knows his family, spends time with them, cherishes them, forms them. I spent a lot of time with Doug on retreat and in private conversation, and I was always just truly inspired at his humility. Especially when Doug told us that he was dying of cancer. We thought, no, I mean, Doug, I think you got it wrong. Just go get a second opinion because there's no possibility that you are dying of cancer, Doug. That's just not right. You're too young. You're not even 50 years old. You've got kids at home. You've got uh, a life to live. You've got 30, 40 more years, Doug. Doug handed me this rosary that he made. And it was at that point that I committed to praying it every day. And until the day I die, I will never not pray this. And if I do, will there be a brother who will correct me? Or will you stand idly by and watch me fail my oath? Will you do nothing? Are you men fully alive? Or are you just another man on the street living for yourself? Watching Doug be buried in front of his children was hard. When I grow up, I want to be Doug Pearson. I want to be a man who is not afraid of his past, but can't wait for the future. Because the whole time Doug is suffering and the cancer spread through his whole body, we watch Doug wither away in front of us. This big brute of a man, a mountain of a man, was almost frail and weak and down to nothing before he died. I was very blessed. I got to talk to Doug a week before he passed. Two days before he could stop talking. And I, I tried my hardest. I said, Doug, he sat there in the hospital bed and he was just staring at this crucifix. I said, Doug, I want to take this from you. I, I want to take this from you. He says, you can't take this from me. God gave this to me. You can't take my cross. What kind of man are you? That you would take my cross. I'm living in God's time. Oh yeah, I would like to stay and help raise those kids. But God's will be done. And he meant it. It wasn't some pious thing to say. I mean, you don't say those things when you're facing the crucifix like he was. You say what you mean, and you mean what you say, and Doug showed heroic leadership to the end. To the end. So I want to be Doug Pearson when I grow up. A man fully alive. The devil tried his best to tear Doug down, to remind him of his past. You know what Doug heard? beating heart of Christ burning within his chest. What do you hear? What will your life be like when they eulogize you at your funeral? What will they say? Oh, he loved football. He was the biggest Texas Tech fan ever. He had a lot of beautiful women in his life. Best job in town. Do you see the car he rode? His house was huge. He got to go on nice vacations. Or will they say he was a man fully alive? 
He impacted every single life God ever put into his path. Nobody ever encountered him that didn't walk away a better person in some way, shape, or form. The mistake, brothers, is to think, well, a man fully alive must be a saint. He must be hovering above the earth constantly, bilocating, praying in Aramaic on broken glass. Nope. Man fully alive looks like me. Oh yeah, check out the man swagger. That's right. Looks like you. You look like man fully alive. He's not Mr. Six-Pack, good-looking, charismatic. He's you. He's me. He's every one of us. We must begin to drown out the voice of the devil in our ear, trying to tell us who we're supposed to be, what we're supposed to look like, how we're supposed to talk. And we need to start being who we were created to be, man fully alive. You have a mission and a purpose in this world. The cross is the answer, though, brothers. Without it, you will never be successful. So a man fully alive must know his identity. He must know his mission. But a man fully alive also must have discipline. Must have discipline. And what do I mean by discipline? Do I mean restrict yourself to only one donut per men's conference? No. What I mean is the sacraments and your prayer life. Yes, it is a good thing to be disciplined in physical health. I can learn that. It is a far better thing to be in the pursuit of holiness every day. Trust me, I will have six-pack abs in heaven if I get there. What if I don't? The most dangerous man on the planet is a Catholic man who makes frequent reception of the sacraments. Doug Berry likes to say that from Life on the Rock. The most dangerous man on the planet is a Catholic man who makes frequent reception of the Holy Sacraments, confession and the Holy Eucharist. But adoration, brothers, is a secret weapon. Recently, I started a holy hour just for men in Houston, Texas. We are, some say, the third largest, some say the fourth largest. At any rate, we are a major city in the United States. There's over six million people that live there, one and a half million Catholics. We have 30 parishes with more than 3,000 registered families each. Our largest parish is probably around 15,000 registered families. But I bet if you think, Houston, you probably think of Joel Osteen and his basketball arena. We've got Joel beaten spades. But Houston also has increasing crime. We have the largest abortion mill in the United States, for sure, but possibly only second to the one in China. More babies are murdered in my city than in any other city in America on a daily basis. Man fully alive would not tolerate that on his watch. We have tons of homeless people, hungry, confused, hurting. But I live in a city that has since made it almost illegal to feed them. I could be arrested for giving food to someone who's hungry. Man fully alive would never allow that lopsided injustice on his watch. Human persons need the love of God. And he sends you to give it to them. So a man fully alive has to know his identity. He has to have mission. He has to be disciplined in receiving the sacraments on a very frequent basis. And I'm not just talking about once a week. I mean, Omar, you and I were talking this morning about a gentleman, a Vietnamese gentleman who was imprisoned in Vietnam. By the grace of God, one of the guards is a fellow Catholic, lets him escape. And today his testimony, now decades later, 
is that that guard likely was murdered for it. But Lord, I can't get up on Sunday. I mean, it's a little early for me to be getting out of bed on a Sunday morning. I mean, after all, Saturday night was a late night. Do we have any idea how many Christians are suffering in Iraq, in Syria, in Egypt, in Nigeria right now? I mean, I wear this pen right here. This is the Arabic letter for N. This is the letter that ISIS paints on the houses of Christians when they take over a new city and a town and a village. They mark where the Christians live. And you'll be lucky if they give you a day or so to get out. Normally it's not. It's like an hour or two if you're lucky. And then they just start slaughtering and stealing, raping and pillaging, taking your wife and using her as a sex slave. Did you know in your backyard right here in good old Amarillo, Texas, human beings are sold on the slave market? Did you know that? Are you aware of that? Right under your watch. But don't feel bad. My town's worse. The injustice in our world is large. Amen? Amen. Good news. He's responsible for success. You're responsible for effort and attitude. You need to show up for the fight. So a band of brothers is the next thing a man fully alive must have. How many nights at Columbus? Praise be to Jesus. A man fully alive must be within a band of brothers. But it can't just be, Brother Knights, I'm fourth degree. It can't just be our business meetings, Brother Knights. Yes, that. And formation, mentorship, and action. A band of brothers helps us to live out our faith, virtue, and action. The Knights are phenomenal at action. Our programs are wonderful. We do some incredible service to the church. Amen? Amen. To the community. Amen? Amen? When is the last time you have truly and honestly gotten together and shared your wounds with your brother so that he can mentor you? When is the last time you met with him and prayed with him because he's suffering, because in his home, his marriage is on the brink of divorce? When is the last time you walked up to a brother and said, brother, I get the feeling you're struggling with something. What can I do to help you? Can we pray? A man fully alive must be engaged with his brothers, mentoring, because we allow men to fall prey to their sins and disordered passions. The devil takes them off the field of battle. We can't allow that anymore. No soul left behind. So I want to encourage you, brothers. Take the Knights to the next level. Be the strong right arm of the church. Grow in virtue and in formation with your brothers. Meet outside of the council meeting for prayer and fellowship. And then engage. A man fully alive is engaged in the battle. We've talked a lot about it already. There is much to be done. Now, last night, we sort of touched on this at dinner. I am a big big fan of every man discerning their skills, their aptitudes, and their gifts, and then applying those to the work of the church. In Catholic ministry, I've seen this way too many times. Well, everybody should be over here doing this thing, and everybody should be over here doing this thing, and then there's some resentment for the other person because you're doing this and they're doing that and you feel like they should be over here and you should be over there. That's a mistake. That's the devil creating division in our ranks. In my house, not everybody does the dishes. Somebody's got to take out the trash. But every member of my family works. And it all is the work of the family. Amen? So some of you brothers are going to be called to the work of defending life in front of the abortion mill. Go and do it. Some of you brothers are going to be called to feeding the homeless and the hungry or going into our prisons. Go 
and do it. Some of you brothers are going to be called to giving counseling or mentorship to families who are facing divorce. Go and do it. And if you know of another brother who's on a mission that's not yours, pray for him and support him however you can. But do not resent him because he does not feel the same as you or as passionate as you in your mission. You see, the beautiful thing about our Catholic faith is we have a fence around our playground. And we can play. Statistically, they've done studies. Playgrounds with no gated fences, the kids tend to stay very close to the center because they don't know their boundaries. Playgrounds with fences around, they play the, the entire surface. They make use of the whole area. That is a good analogy of the Catholic Church. Within our church, we have lots to do and lots to play. Go and do it. Master your domains. Evangelii Nuntiandi, it's a document Pope Paul VI put out in 1974. I've got a copy of it right there if anybody wants to see it. It says, the duty of the layperson in evangelizing the world is to bring to bear, to master, to conquer the world. Society, politics, the arts, media, the family. Some of you brothers are going to be called to political action. Get involved. What is the Lord calling you to? Stop sitting on the sidelines. Stop living your mundane life. It is boring and uninteresting. When you die, leave it all on the field. Live a phenomenal, incredible existence by being a man fully alive. Feel the beating of the heart of Christ within your chest. My buddy Mark Hauck, the founder of the Kingmen, said, as long as Catholic men fail to live out their role as leader, protector, and provider, the consequences are staggering. The consequences are staggering. I can't emphasize it enough. The opportunity has never been better. The lines drawn in society are now more clear than they ever have been. Amen? Stop thinking like the secular world. Stop thinking along Republican versus Democrat, Libertarian or whatever. That's not who you are. You are a Catholic, son of the Most High God. You do the right thing. Because man fully alive does not wait for others to do the right thing when he knows it must be done. Abandon your labels and accept who you are. Live and breathe by it. Do you feel the burn in your chest? Or are you dead to the world? The disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke's Gospel said, Did not our hearts burn within us? <laughs> I tell you, after my conversion experience in April of 2002, I felt exactly like that. Like my heart was on fire. Like I was free for the first time ever to pursue holiness and happiness. And let me tell you, life was never this good before. Never. Ever. Every time I used pornography, abused myself or other persons, I never found satisfaction. I found shame. A hole that I had to fill and I had to keep trying to consume something that would please me or make me feel alive. But none of it ever did. Not ever. It was only until God filled the hole that it made any sense whatsoever. Amen? Man fully alive has the heart of the Savior of the universe burning in his chest. Is that you? Or shall we look for another? Because there's no backup plan. There's no B team. It's not like i got to go over to the craft show to find the real men over there. Because you guys just aren't up for the task. The Lord doesn't have a JV team somewhere. 
He's got you. You're it. Man fully alive says, give me the ball and put me in the game. Because man fully alive knows he has nothing to fear. If God is for us, who can be against us? Amen? Amen. And I can do all things through Christ. Amen? Amen? Because I don't have to be responsible for success. I'm just giving my effort and attitude. And when I fall, I get up. And I go to confession, which I think will be in that room later on. I'll go to confession. I'll confess my sins and I'll hear the voice of Christ say, I absolve you. And I will float out of that confessional back into the fight. In your family, you must be the rock. The immovable rock. You already know this, but the temptations that your family faces, you grandparents, it's your grandkids, it's your kids and their kids, the temptations they face are large and powerful. The fear that they have every day, the anxieties that we don't talk about, that are there under the surface and we just pretend like they're not. They're immense. You have to be a rock. The immovable rock that doesn't sway when the wind blows this way or that way. Don't believe the lies. The devil will whisper into your ear. But be manfully alive. Model to your family the kind of men that you want your sons to be, or their sons. They're looking at you. And it scares me when I look into my son's faces and I see my faults and my failures and I just cringe. But you know what? I, I'm reminded in that moment, this is an opportunity at humility. And so I will ask my sons to forgive me and I'll hug them, and I'll kiss them, and I will show them affection from a man. Or are you going to let them grow up to be as macho and as hard as nails as the next guy? Man fully alive leads with his weakness, shows his vulnerability, and in that he is strong. The Lord could have conquered anybody and everybody. He could have called down 12 legions of angels to conquer the world. Instead, he cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Are you alive, brothers? Do you not hear that sound? Or are you dead? The opportunity in this world is big and awesome and just incredible. If you'll seize the opportunity, brothers, you bring the dignity of the human person through the light of Christ into your community. And you watch what the Lord will accomplish through you. He'll change this place. This will become a beacon of love, hope, and virtue. You watch what you do when you march down this road in a Eucharistic procession as a body of men leading the way to the abortion mills and the sex shops and the strip clubs. And you stand there as a witness out of love, out of love for the men and the women inside. And you watch what happens. You want abortion to end? Hunger? Homelessness? Stand up and be manfully alive, and it will. The Lord is simply waiting for you. It's all on us to cooperate with Him. Give Him your yes, and He will burn within your chest. Amen? God bless you, brothers. God bless you.